Hello there. Um, first of all, can I just say that if you are a virgin in the audience, Alistair Crowley was not a particularly safe person to be around. Okay. Um, the talk tonight, can I just give you a BBC type warning? Um, tonight's talk uh, will feature scenes of cruelty, sadism, psychopathy, um, explicit sexual references, sacrifices, and the maltreatment of women. Okay, just to let you know that would be the case. So it's going to be a, a typical feast of family fun. <laughs> On the other hand, there are limits, and I don't want to go too far. So even though we are approaching All Souls Eve, the time when ghostly spirits come out of their graves and walk the earth, clearly a factual phenomenon, for how else do you explain re-smog? <laughs> you will nevertheless have an opportunity this evening to escape from the scariest words in the English language. I refer, of course, to No Deal Brexit. Amen. Now, Alistair Crowley. Alistair Crowley was known as the wickedest man in the world. And there is a link between that and the fact that in my hand I have a pebble. Does anyone know why I would have a pebble in my hand when talking about Alistair Crowley? Yeah? And it is? That is right. That you are trapped in St. Venice. Not the worst place in the world for me to be trapped. Trapped in Hastings unless you have in your pocket a pebble with a hole in it. This one does not have a hole in it. And so I will be safely remaining here this evening. He cursed Hastings. And there's a reason why he cursed Hastings and I will come to that later on. Alistair Crowley was known as the wickedest man in the world. Not just Europe. In the world. That was the headline when he died. When he died, Hastings Borough Council would not allow him to be buried in Hastings. And the undertakers of Bexhill would not touch the body, so he had to be buried in Brighton. How does somebody get such a terrible reputation? Was he somebody who ate children? No, he wasn't. But what he was thought to be was a traitor. Okay, so that was a major thing against him. But he was the person, par excellence, that the Daily Mail loved to hate. He had exactly the same role for the tabloids in his time as that preacher Sit Chowdhury has at the present moment. He was the hate symbol that the Daily Mail would try to get people to loathe. Because the Daily Mail's principle in life, of course, is to give people, as its, as its owner said, their daily dose of hate. And he was the person yeah. that they... It, that's right, isn't it? He was the person they tried to get you to go against. But also, uh, he was notorious for his sexual practices. And that was something that came to light after the um, disaster, in some ways, of his attempt to set up a commune at a place called Cephalu. And um, this got into the tabloids. It was all over the papers about the various practices that went on there, to which I will refer again later on this evening. How did he come to be like that? Well, he grew up in a respectable home, in Leamington Spa. His father um, was a brewer, but also, strangely enough, a member of the Plymouth Brethren, a very strange combination. And he, in fact, um, had quite a lot of money because he owned what was a kind of um, chain of wine bars and also a brewery. And so, had he not sold them to Watney's, which is how he eventually, the, the firm came to an end, had he not sold it, we could today actually be drinking Crowley's L's in a Crowley's bar, but no longer, okay? His upbringing, of course, was puritanical, strict, and in many ways joyless. The Plymouth Brethren were sect, and one of their most fundamental beliefs was that it was important to, in, to ensure that at all times you avoided sin. Sin was an ever-present reality, threatening you with eternal damnation, and so you always had to be watchful. They also believed that the second coming of Christ was imminent. And although, like a southeastern train, it did tend to be a bit delayed, they nevertheless did not despair of it coming quite soon. And so Crowley grew up with this tremendous consciousness of sin 
and the desirability of avoiding it. Now, his mother, too, was a person who um, was, was also a Plymouth Brethren, and um, if anything, even more extreme than the father was. Let's have a look at the slide. This here is um, some of the things about uh, what was wrong with him, how uh, he had, um, uh, he was somebody who um, had this, the journalist delighted in attacking him, and Horatio Bottomley branded him a degenerate cannibal, everything he could think of. Horatio Bottomley was a kind of Boris Johnson of World War I. Um, he made his money well, he had a lot of money anyway, but he made more money by being paid enormous sums by the British government to go around recruiting people to die in the First World War. He pocketed a great deal of that money. And at the point where he thought he might be threatened, he did a Trump-like manoeuvre and decided the thing to do was to attack somebody else. And so he attacked Crowley. Now, one of the things he attacked Crowley for was because, whilst in America, he had written articles praising the Kaiser, as you can see here, as an angel of God, and criticising the British royal family. But more than that, he had encouraged the Germans to sink the Lusitania. With the loss, of course, it happened of about 2,000 lives. Now, it subsequently has emerged that Crowley's story about this is probably true. He argued that he was acting as an agent to the British government to bring the Americans into the war. And only in quite recent times, a note has been unearthed um, in Washington, saying the American government knew that Crowley was an agent of the British government. So, although that may seem a far-fetched story, there is some evidence to actually substantiate it. But on those grounds, of course, he was attacked for treachery, and people were amazed that he was allowed back into England when he came back from America. So that was yet another thing which they had against him. Now, growing up in this um, kind of environment, you can see that he would either have to accept being a member of the Plymouth Brethren, or he would have to rebel against it. And of the two, it was the rebellion. That was the side he went for. He was a person of a very factual, very analytical frame of mind, very literal frame of mind in some ways. So that, for example, when his mother told him that a cat had nine lives, he decided to prove her wrong. How would you go about proving that a cat didn't have nine lives? Any ideas? Kill it. Kill it, exactly. But that would only deal with one life, wouldn't it? So, of course, he went a bit further with this. And this extremism, this extremity, is so completely characteristic of him. Because this is what he did. First of all, he caught a cat. Then he dosed it with arsenic. Then he chloroformed it. I have warned you, Debbie Cruelty. Then he gassed it. Then he stabbed it. Yes, exactly. Then he covered it in um, some kind of plaster, he slit its throat, he set light to it, drowned it, dropped it from a great height, and then declared that indeed it could be proved that a cat didn't have nine lives. So this will give you some insight into another side of him. There was a streak of sadism and cruelty in his character that is a continuing theme during the course of his life. Now, at first, he has a Hastings connection. At the age of eight, he was sent away to a boarding school, a boarding school run by a person called Habershon at the White Rock. Um, so, so in those days, it was known to this school. Now, Habershon was, rather like maybe the rest of his upbringing had been, Habershon was a very strict person, a very religious person, and when Crowley made a bit of a joke in answering an exam question, the headmaster took exception to it and had him flogged. Of course, Crowley didn't take kindly to this, and so he wished the headmaster dead. Yes. And that's what happened. The headmaster died. And so, as far as Crowley was concerned, that was his first magical achievement. So he set on his road. From then on, he went on to other schools where he was bullied and buggered, at a school um, in the north of England, he had the misfortune to share a room with a person who acted as a pimp, who charged people to have sex as a boy with him. And obviously these experiences did leave a very profound mark. He then went to Cambridge, where he excelled, and I think this might be a good moment to have another slide. 
There he is, he's a young man. And here is a picture of the devil's chimney. Now, another thing that um, uh, Crowley did was he was a mountaineer. He was able to climb up Beachy Head. This was thought by other mountaineers at the time to be completely impossible for the obvious reason that it's made of chalk, okay? But he was able to find footholds. He had a remarkable ability as a mountaineer to be able to estimate the crumbling point of chalk or the collapsing point of ice. And so he was a most remarkable um, mountaineer. He actually held the altitude record for the world as a mountaineer for seven years, as well as the endurance record for staying at high altitude. So, in some ways, I think we're beginning to see that Crowley was a very mixed character. Sinner or saint? He was both. Sinner and saint, okay? A man of remarkable abilities, a person who in a way was a bit like a Michelangelo, but kind of, a kind of a mixture, if you like, a Stephen Fry and Lucifer, okay? So, a strange combination of qualities there in him. I'm going to move on as quickly as I can now to something that became extremely important about him, and that was his religion. He created a religion. How did he do that? Well, first of all, he had to do it with somebody or through somebody, and this person was a woman called Rose. Her story is a lovely story, and it illustrates part of Crowley's remarkable character. Rose was a widow, and she was engaged to be married to an extremely boring man, as Crowley did. But at the same time, she was having a very passionate affair with a married man whom she loved. Her family were pressuring her to marry the boy and to give up the affair. Crowley, as was fairly typical of him, sympathised with her against the family and came up in a Baldrick-like way with a cunning plan. The cunning plan was that if she would marry him, he wouldn't be making any marital demands upon her whatsoever, and she'd be then free to carry on with her affair. Great. So, being a very persuasive person, he managed to get Rose to agree to this astounding scheme. They ran away together, they got married, and at this point you need to know that in Scotland, where they married, marriage is a two-stage affair. First of all, there's the ceremony, and then you have to register the marriage. The family, getting wind of this, sent a solicitor to break the marriage up. So Crowley said, look, let's go away and discuss it in a hotel. Oh, I've already said about being a virgin. Fatal. Because hotel, Crowley, woman, it could only go one way. And it presumably did. Because after that night, they were a proper couple. He whisked her away on a honeymoon to Egypt. And there, he took her into the Great Pyramid, the inner sanctuary of the Great Pyramid. You could do that sort of thing in those days. When I was young, you could just walk onto Stonehenge. You could just walk onto it. No problems. In they went to the sacred heart of that pyramid. And there, by his magic, he produced a luminescence that lasted the entire night. Rose was highly impressed, as well she might have been. This sure is a great impressed than going away and having a honeymoon in Skegness with a rather boring solicitor. <laughs> now, Rose, however, was able to more than return the favour. Because later, when they went back there, in a state of some drunkenness, it appears, which was characteristic of her, as you may hear later, in a state of some drunkenness, she started to utter what Crowley thought were some kind of words associated with magic, saying that the god Horus, with that point Crowley had not heard of, was going to want to commune. And she also made some other references. <coughs> and said that he should go to a particular point at 12 o'clock, armed with paper. And that he did. Then he heard a voice that was deep and sonorous and yet gentle, dictating to him that a new age had begun, a new eon. And this was to be the one that he was to govern. He was to be the person to bring a new religion to the world. Took all this down, and surprisingly enough for Crowley, because he was quite an egocentric man, he was rather frightened by this prospect. And he put the manuscript away. And although he told friends he was going to do something about it, he didn't. He just did nothing for a very long period of time. 
later on he found it. And this was, and then he decided it was his duty to proclaim to the world the Lima, the religion of the Lima. Now this was a religion with a wonderful idea. It may well appeal to all of you. Its central tenet was, do what thou wilt. You know, this is the whole of the law. What a great idea, okay? None of this stuff about restriction, none of this stuff about faithfulness, none of this stuff about chastity, none of all that. Crowley had decided that, yes, there were two great forces in the world, God and Satan, but they got it round the wrong way. Because God wanted us to be chaste, God didn't want us to have sex, and therefore God was evil, but got it wrong. We should be on the side of Satan. Satan was the good one because he wanted us to enjoy ourselves. He wanted us to be free. And so did Crowley. And this is what his religion, the Lima, was all about. And so, in a way, you can see that he was very much in advance of his time. Because some of the criticisms he makes of Orthodox religion and religion, you will find in Dawkins' book on the same subject. He believed that as part of this process of getting fulfillment and ecstasy, that you should also use drugs. And he wrote a very serious book arguing for the legalization of drugs, which is not so very different from the Liberal Democrat policy on the same subject. <laughs> so that he was in many ways remarkably in advance of his time. Now, what I thought I would do next is to just see what would happen if you try and experiment with one of his magical beliefs. Okay? So this is what I would like you to do. I've got to shuffle my notes here because I've been speaking without referring to them, so if you'll give me a moment or two, I will do that. What I would like you to do is, could you please imagine that some distance in front of you, there is like a pillar of light. This pillar of light is to become where the repository of your consciousness in the moment. Can you please imagine in front of you, close your eyes if you like, can you imagine in front of you some sort of Can you imagine? Can you now throw your consciousness into project your consciousness into If you're finding it difficult, could you please imagine that there are spiritual forces? That was his instructions to one of his friends, one of the disciplines that you could do in order to experience the transcendence that could come about through magic. Um, I've actually not taken that quite as far as I could because we're a little bit short of time. Had we had a bit more time, I might have asked, if you wouldn't mind, please, could you just merge your sexual bodily fluids with the person next door? <laughs> but because we're a bit short of time, I, I think maybe in your own free time, you know, there'll be an interview, you know, like it, just do it. Now, so, so, magic was important for him, and he used the magic in various ways to protect himself against magical attacks from other people, to increase his self-consciousness, his self-awareness, to do astral flying. He did various things, but they were not necessarily particularly evil things on the whole. Although, although, there is a little bit of a problem here. And so this is where the problem comes in and where things may have got a bit out of hand. And we've also realized 
that Crowley had a very sadistic streak to him. So although on the whole his use of magic can be said to be benign, can be said to be what used to be called white magic, there is another side. Now, a little bit about how Crowley thought of magic. He thought that magic consisted of controlling the forces, the spiritual forces there are in the world. These are, of course, good and bad. The traditional belief is the good are generally more powerful than the bad, but the problem is the bad are nevertheless powerful and can get out of control and can affect human beings. And people who kind of interpret the life of Crowley in magical terms say that that is the sort of thing that sometimes happened. So there was an occasion, for example, when Crowley was carrying out some magical ceremonies, went out for the evening and came back to find his flat full, absolutely every inch taken up by demons cavorting there to the amazement of himself and his companions. He also bought a place in Scotland, Bolskin, which later became the home of Jimmy Page, by the way, the Zed, uh, Led Zeppelin guitarist, um, where all kinds of things took place. People who went there often fled because they were so disturbed by what happening. Um, people who were associated with that building went mad, tried to murder people, became alcoholics, etc. It wasn't, he was, in, he was a little bit like what was said of Baba. Mad, bad, and dangerous to know. People who were connected with him did tend to meet early deaths. There's no doubt about that. Um, one of his mistresses lent a scarf. Guess who too? In whose life is a scarf? Yes, Isadora Duncan. And it was that scarf which wound itself around the wheel of an open-top car, pulled her head back, and kills her. Being connected with Crowley was a slightly dangerous thing to do. Now, just sort of coming a little bit more towards the end, let's just see a slide or two more. Now, this is Beachy Head, and I thought I might just mention that one day when he was climbing there, his mother was dangling over the edge of the cliff, as people are inclined to do, fell, Crowley spurted up, saved her life, and regarded it throughout his entire life as one of the worst things he ever did. <laughs> so, he did save somebody's life, but he thought it was a bad thing. Okay, that's, here he is in his magical robes. Now, Crowley has had a kind of afterlife. He's had an afterlife, for example, the very first Bond villain, the very first Bond film, the villain in that is based upon him. So, you may know of Alistair Crowley, even though you think you don't, okay? Plus, he then came back to Hastings, where he eventually died. Whilst he was here, he did some other things. He finished his greatest book, which is called Magic. He invented, with a friend, tarot cards that are still used today. But by this time, he was an alcoholic and drug addict. As he lay dying, he cried out for heroin, and his doctor said, no, you're not going to have it. He was cursed by Crowley. Three days later, the doctor was found dead in his bath. Another story. You know how um, yeah, not much time. Yeah. Yeah. You know how um, I said about Jimmy Page. One of the one of the songs there is. Um, is this so I can play it? What do I do? Good. Okay, right. One of the famous songs there is "Stay Away from Heaven." Apparently, if you analyse the words in "Stay Away from Heaven." you will see references to Satan if it's played backwards. Now, believe it or not, Rolling Stone fact check say that is true. How about that? But finally, we come to the last horrible story. Oh, now that's a painting it is. There we are. This was a record, okay? It's a record by a group. And um, what they intended to do, I have no idea, by the way, where my note on this part is, what they intended to do was to use the Crowley anthem, what you will is the whole of the law, and change it and do anything you want. But at the same time, they made fun of Crowley, you see, by putting Mickey Mouse ears around him. Well, this, the, the, the theory goes, either it could have displeased Crowley directly, or alternatively, Jimmy Page deliberately put a curse upon the group that put this out. The group actually got to the top ten with this song, Do Anything You Want. It got to the top ten. Following this, 
Their leading person became a drug addict. They lost their contract with the record company and were never successful ever again. So, rather importantly, Alistair Crowley was not a person to mess with. Thank you very much. Well, there we are. Crowley, but he's dead. He died, didn't he? In, uh, was it 47? 47. 47, he died. Does anybody, now at the, the, the Babar, what we do is there's time for questions uh, from the speaker. So if anybody has any, any burning questions, I shall come dashing into the audience in the style of uh, Kuroi Silk uh, and, uh, and, look for, uh, and look for hands waving, possibly, or, or anybody. Does anybody have any questions for, for Richard about Alistair Crowley and his. Uh, yes, over there. Let me just uh, run over to you, Andrew. Hang on a second. Yeah. Hello. Uh, I was wondering how you think uh, Alistair might have fared in the Me Too era. Sorry, I didn't hear the question. Well, how do you think he would have fared in the Me Too era? You know, well, um, <laughs> I'm not clear because it's really good, which is rather interesting. He said that a woman should be delivered at the back door like the bill. So that's not exactly going to impress the Me Too generation. He also said the ideal woman is somebody who you take down from the shelf, okay, and who is content to stay there until you want her. So his attitude towards women would not exactly fare well. And I also think that, rather interestingly, although his views were taken up by the hippies, they turned a blind eye to the side of him that we would now regard as particularly disreputable. Okay? And I think that's rather an important thing. He became a hero because of his revolutionary ideas, because of his belief that drug taking could be a means to personal emancipation, that it could, it could lead to spiritual fulfillment. So he, he appealed to people to whom people like Timothy Leary, okay? but obviously no modern feminist is going to give him the time of day. Excellent. So there we are. He wasn't a, a, a massive feminist, I think, is the, uh, <laughs> what we've got. So any, any other questions for Richard? Um, I'm, I'm looking, but I'm conscious of the light. And I'm also conscious of the time, because uh, I know you Bavarians want to have uh, drinks. So if there's no more questions... Uh, oh, sorry, beg your pardon. Yeah. Well, it wasn't a question, it was more of a statement. Right? And, um, you, you mentioned a couple of, a couple of times Jimmy Page in yeah. your um, yeah. And I do know for a fact house in the central London as well. And yeah. he lives and his neighbour is Rob, Robbie Williams. Oh yeah. Yeah. And uh, it was the house that Michael Winner used to live in before he passed away. <laughs> so, sorry, I'm not used to this. And um, and ever since um, they had a major fallout while whilst uh, Robbie Williams was um, refurbing his house. And uh, Ever since that time, I'm always curious whether Jimmy Page has cast a curse on Robbie Williams because his career has really plummeted ever since. <laughs> so <laughs> so the, the statement is, we'll have to see how that hangs out. <laughs> yeah, I mean, associating with him is not a good thing, you know. A number of the people who, uh, the women who associated with him died young. Um, one of the men with whom he had an affair the same. Um, with, with Jimmy Page, he of course bought Borskin, um, he also had a bookshop and record shop in London, um, which he named after um, a famous book by Alistair Crowley. Um, he's got the greatest collection of Alistair Crowley memor memorabilia that anybody has, and there are various themes from Crowley's writings that work their way into all raw of Led Zeppelin songs, there are about 10 or 12 Led Zeppelin songs with Crowley references in them. And there is also some suspicion, you know, it has been said, that maybe Led Zeppelin, just like Paganini, the famous Victorian um, violinist, was said to have a compact with the devil, which enabled him to play so well. It has been said that was also true of Led Zeppelin, and that three of them actually took part in that, that arrangement with the devil, and one of them kept out of it. And the, of course, the suspicion is that Jimmy Page was the person who encouraged him to do it. But uh, whether that's responsible for the decline of Robbie Williams' career or not, I wouldn't well. <laughs> we'll, 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 we'll say it is. We'll say it is. Any, uh, any other final questions for Richard before, um, before we take a break? Uh, I can't see any hands. If, uh, in which case, can we thank Richard for a fabulous... <laughs>